Brother Hill was born in Richmond, New Richmond, Ohio. He grew up in Dayton, Ohio. And he served for many years in the United States Navy. I don't know why he put this in there, but honorably discharged. I thought at first when I read it, it said honorary and discharged. But it's honorably. <laughs> well, the truth of the matter is, it is quite a compliment when you think of the meaning of the word honorable and having completed your term in anything that's right and wholesome to be honorably discharged. You know, that's what we look for when we leave this earth. <laughs> he and his wife, Jerry, we're glad she's with us, were married in August 1974, and they are the proud parents of one son, Justin. He and his wife, Shannon, have a, uh, so far given them one grandson, Connor, and all three are currently in China teaching conversational English at a university and, and using that opportunity, I may say, well, it's, uh, this is going out over the internet, so I won't say it, in view of who all tampers around with the internet. Gene has preached for congregations in Florida, Kentucky, Pennsylvania, Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, where he is now. He's a 1978 graduate of the Florida School of Preaching under the late B.C. Carr when he was the director. We're very pleased to have Brother Gene come and speak to us. And he will be speaking on the New Testament church is foreign to the church described in a gathered people that we just heard about. Come and speak to us, Brother Gene. Again, I, like the other speakers, I appreciate this opportunity to be here and to talk about the things we talk about. Um, I had Brother Hightower as an instructor at the School of Preaching. And it's not that we don't love Brother Terry, it's just it takes so many of us shoveling as hard as we do to just break even with the brother. <laughs> but uh, I do appreciate Tower. Uh, he's, he's had a great impression upon me and uh, has helped me quite a lot uh, in, in, in my work. My task, uh, I guess it took two of us to do this, uh, to, to do, deal with this book of which I also have a copy that I have read at least three different times. One of the things I learned in going in, in high school when I had a teacher teaching us how to do research, so you get the book and you skim through it. You look at the contents, you look at the index, then you skim through it, you look at the chapter headings, you look at the the breakdowns and you know how the author breaks it down and then you go through and you read it and then you go through the third time with a pen or a pencil or a highlighter in your hand and then you start taking notes and and skip had the hard part he he had the hard part i've got the easy part i just have to tell you what the truth is and he had to tell you about all the error that's in the book um, the only honest way to review and then to critique a work of another is to purchase the work as it's been published, to read it and study it in order to understand what has been written as, as much as humanly possible. And that's my assignment in this book, is to deal with some of the things involved in it. Now, personal integrity, basic honesty, Christian love, and a concern for the hearts and souls and eternal destinies, not only of those writing the book, but those that may read it later on as well as my own in offering this review places a huge burden on carrying out this assignment. I do not take this lightly. I do not take this lightly at all. This book is a, it's a very insulting book to the Lord and to the church that he purchased, that God purchased with his own blood. Now what right or obligation do I or anyone else have to review and critique the work of another? What right do we have to do that? Well, it's no more nor less than the Bereans of Acts chapter 17, verses 10 and 11. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily whether the, these things were so. Now, in my mind, I have this image of these, brother, these men sitting there, and women and so forth, sitting there listening to the apostles speak, taking notes, and then when the sermon was done, the lesson was done, going to the scrolls and rolling out the scrolls and comparing what they heard Paul 
say in the notes they took in class, if you will, to what the scriptures had to say. Now there's what Terry was talking about yesterday. It's induction and deduction. And then as, as Brother Brown made a comment a few moments ago, is making the application. How does that apply to us? And if we can't do that, then we're just all wasting our time. So what things are these brethren writ written, and, and are they so? And that's the only issue before us. And if words have any meanings, then we can read what they wrote, understand their minds on the issues addressed. And that's the assignment of what Skip and I and all the rest of us have in all these various lectures. Now, there are some preliminary considerations here. We must have before us the standard in order to readily discern attempts at counterfeiting an object and to prevent us from being led astray by those seeking a following. Now, the U.S. Treasury Departments and banks, when they're training their employees, they don't use counterfeit money. They get the real thing. They get, a, you know, feel this. See how it feels. See how, how, how it weighs. And look at it up at the light and, and look at the things. Here's how you identify the good stuff. They don't even get to the bad stuff for a while in those training, in those training uh, sessions. There is, and I, I use this term when I talk to my religious friends, neighbors, and relatives, and I use it to... You remember the old 45s and 78 and 33 RPM records that to get the scratch in it, you'd have to slap the side of the record player to get it to skip out of that groove? We have to do that to get people to stop thinking the way they normally think. So when I don't, I don't talk about the church because you get, well, that's just your church. Why would I be a member of your church? I call it the religious institution that you can read about upon the pages of the New Testament. And invariably they go, what? They have stopped thinking about my church and their church to this religious institution about the page, on the page of the New Testament. That it is unique in authority and authorship and time of inception and place of beginning and terms of entrance. That's what we're talking about this morning. These guys weren't. They weren't. They were talking about something called the Stone Campbell Heritage and Movement and all the rest of that. And that's not the religious institution you read about upon the page of the New Testament. This institution has an origin that is exclusive and unable to be duplicated by any other religious organization. It cannot be done. We, of course, are referring to that religious institution that Jesus promised to build and to which we find him adding people to, um, to as they were being saved. Jesus said, I will build my church, Matthew 16, 18. And Luke recording... In Acts 2, 47, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So somewhere between Matthew 16, 18 and, and Acts 2 and verse 47, that which Jesus promised to build came into existence because he was putting folks into it. Now somewhere in between there, that institution came into being as a viable organization that people could possess. It is correct to conclude then that that which Jesus promised to build was, according to the events in Acts Chapter 2, available for the Lord to add people to. Now, this religious institution has a unique authority. The appearance of Jesus to the disciples, as recorded in Matthew 28, 18, Mark 16, 15, and Luke 24, 46, are some of the last words uttered by Jesus while on earth. Called by most folks the Great Commission passages, these verses provide for us the marching orders given to the apostles and passed to us through their recorded words. And as Terry said yesterday, how do we know that anything in there applies to us? My name's Terry's name isn't in there. My name's not in there. Now, my wife, in a book she gave, in a Bible she gave me years ago for a birthday or Christmas, she, she wrote on the inside front cover of it to my husband, Gene. Well, that's not me in the, in the text of it. That's me on the inside front cover. Okay, how do I know that anything in there applies to me if I can't read it and understand it and, and make application as was pointed out? Um... All this, these words were recorded about 45, some 45 days or so prior uh, to, to the events in Acts chapter 2 by the Thursday night events recorded in John chapters 13 through 17. And I would suggest you read those, those chapters. Now, in these chapters under consideration, Jesus told his disciples that they would receive the comforter. or the, Now, he's speaking specifically to a group of people. And when those people were addressed, the things addressed to them applied to them and them only, not to you and me today. And I think that's crucial. If you, and if you don't understand implications, friends, it's just the rest of this just won't mean anything to you. 
So, but that doesn't mean you should stop listening by, by any means. But uh, that they would receive the comfort of the Holy Ghost who would bring to their remembrance the things Jesus taught them and instruction in that which they needed to know in order to be the ambassadors and witnesses he needed them to be. And those passages are John 14, 16, and 26, John 15, 26, and 27, and, and chapter 16, 13. And of course, this is all in the, in the, in the, in the book. And since the word is the seed of the kingdom, Luke 8 and verse 11, and since it is by the word that souls are saved, and when they heard Philip, Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of heaven, what did they do? They obeyed the gospel. They were all baptized, both men and women. Then we can see the importance of having a message conveyed by and taught through words. That I can sit down and read and study and understand. And notice we didn't get any of the terminology in this book that we have in this one. That tells you something. We find another illustration of the importance of the revealed word is found in Paul's words to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 6 beginning. That which they wrote and spoke came by the Spirit, and I, the uppercase Spirit, the Holy Spirit, from the mind of God, according to verse 10, that the Spirit searched the deep things of God. If the words revealed to the apostles and passed on to us by them is that which was revealed by the Holy Spirit upon searching the, mind, the deep things of God, then why would faithful Christians... Faithful Christians not pursue a greater knowledge and understanding of that revealed word. Why would we not do that? Why would they seek to change or modify what is there? Why would people want to change what is there if this is what helps me obtain remission of sins and helps me uh, sustain that remission of sins? Why would I want to avoid a knowledge and an understanding and then apply what's here if it's the mind of God? Now, how do we learn this information? We learn it by teaching. It's written, they shall all be taught of God, John 6, 44 and 45. And then how do we know we have it right? Hereby we do know that we know him, that we do what? Keep the commandments of God, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 3. And we ought to understand the words of the Bible's text in their common, everyday, literal understanding unless there is something in the text which would not make sense when taken literally. For instance, in John chapter 10 and verse 7, Jesus said, I am the door of the sheep. Now think about that. Now, was he literally a door? Did he have a left hand or a right hand throw? Did he open in or did he open out? Where was the doorknob? Was it in the center as you've seen? You, well, you see, well, you say that's just silliness, preacher. And I said, that's exactly right. That is silliness. As one brother said, mossed over and gone to sea. Not only... No, it only makes sense when we understand the context of the parable he was teaching about sheep, sheep folds, and shepherds. If you don't look at the context, you won't understand the point of it all. There's that induction and deduction process that Hightower was talking about yesterday. Man, if we don't understand that, then we're in trouble. In Luke chapter 13, 31, when Jesus called Herod a fox, was he one literally or only in a figurative sense? If we saw Herod... Would we see a little doggy looking thing, red in color possibly, with a pointy nose and a little black dot on the end of it and a big red bushy tail? Well, of course not. And it's absurd to think that. If we don't understand that sometimes the words are not meant to be literal, they convey some other idea by the, those words that are used. Now, furthermore, we should understand implication and how it is applied in studying Scripture. Now, again, as I said earlier, since my name doesn't appear anywhere in the text of the Bible, why should I conclude that anything in the Scripture applies to me or applies to you? I can only make sense of the Bible's commands and how they might apply to me if I understand implication. I know that at least some things in the Bible apply to me when I read Matthew 28, 18 and Mark 16, 16. Why? Because I am a member of a nation? I live in this world, I am a creature, therefore it is important that I seek out a greater understanding of God's word. John chapter 12, verse 42, many believed in Jesus, but they didn't confess him. And the problem is on the day of judgment, John chapter 12, verse 48, the very words that Jesus spoke that some people refuse to understand today in the light they were uttered are going to be judged by those words. 
Man, do you want to know what God has to say to you? You'd better. You're going to meet it on the day of judgment, and then you will understand. It'll be too late. We must also take into consideration accounts of action appearing in the Bible and whether they are approved or not. Take, for instance, the account of Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5. They sold a piece of property. They brought only a portion of the price to the apostles and presented that portion as the whole sales price, verses 1 and 2. Now, when we read that they both died because they had lied, we learn that honesty is not just the best policy, but the only one accepted by God. If I'm not honest with the word of God, I am lying to myself. And that's the worst tragedy of it all, it seems to me. On the other hand, when we find an apostle acting or cooperating in a specific action or event without any admonishment to the contrary, we can conclude that such actions are acceptable. Consider Paul's actions in Acts chapter 20. Verses 6 and 7, as Skip made mention of a few moments ago, almost stood up and told him to stop. You've got my sermon outline. We find Paul coming to Troas and waiting until Sunday to gather with the disciples in order to partake of the bread of communion and then to preach unto them. We, now, we can know that such activities are acceptable. We can know it was done only on Sunday, the first day of the week, and, then pre and that preaching is acceptable in that same service. Why? Acts 2.42, and they continued steadfastly in apostles' doctrine and fellowship, breaking bread and prayers. Now, why is that important? Because Paul taught the same thing everywhere. When the apostles went out, they taught the same thing everywhere. So it, was, it would have been beyond acceptation to, accept, to, to believe that Paul would do anything other than wait for Sunday to meet with the brethren. Why would he wait for Thursday night? It was never taught that way. And they knew what they were supposed to be doing. There's also an idea, the idea of direct command is given in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. The brethren had been given specific uh, instructions about the great collection, and Paul expected it to be done. We likewise take up a collected offering each first day of the week. Amen, preacher? And consider also Peter's response to the convicted Jews in Acts chapter 2 and verse 37. They, when, they, when they heard these things, they were pricked in their hearts, and they said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Well... Peter's response is in the form of a direct command. Peter responds. Now, by the way, I had an English teacher in junior high school, Mrs. Urbaugh, and she'd be proud to hear me say this. If I were to take Acts 2 and verse uh, uh, 38 to her and have her diagram it, she would diagram it that you would be the subject. It would be implied because it would be in parentheses because the you, the subject, doesn't appear there. It doesn't say you repent. That's implied, right, Terry? He said, repent. Well, who's he speaking to? The folks just said, men and brethren, what shall we do? Well, now, would he turn around and talk to the wall? Well, no. He would turn around and he'd talk to those fellas. Why? Because they asked a question. And what did he say? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, what do you suppose Peter expected them to do? I don't know. The way some of these brethren would think, based upon what they've written. And that's all I have to know about what they think is what they've written. And they don't believe they had done anything, just gone whistling into the wind. Notice the outcome is recorded in, Acts, in, in verse 41 of Acts, 2, 40, of Acts 2. Then they that gladly received his word were back. You know what? We, we yell and jump and scream about 3,000 souls obeying the gospel. Man, there was only 3,000 souls that obeyed the gospel. I'm glad they did it, and I'm sure they are too. But only 3,000 out of all those thousands upon thousands that were there. A lot of them, all of them that heard the word received it. But only 3,000 received it gladly. How do I know? Because they were baptized. They did what they were told to do. What should we do? Well, here's what you ought to do. And the same day, there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Now, this religious institution has a unique author. The Stone Camel Movement, indeed. You know, I'd be afraid to stand next to one of those guys when they uttered that. Because I would want to make sure that I was far enough away when that lightning bolt came down, it wouldn't splash over onto me. And I say that somewhat humorously, but it's serious. The scriptures reveal to us that this religious institution being considered was not an afterthought, but was in fact the determined intention of God for the welfare of his creation. Man, this religious institution Jesus promised to build, Matthew 16, 18, that was purchased by God's blood, Acts 20 and verse 28, to which the Lord added the saved, Acts 2 and verse 47, was designed to make known the manifold wisdom of God, Ephesians chapter 3, which was accomplished by its very existence. Just its standing there. Just those brethren standing there. 
spoke volumes. And then when they started living what they had been taught to do, it, it spoke more volumes than what God wanted to be done. This religious institution's real beginning was in the mind of God from before the very foundation of the world, Matthew 25 and 34. This, the character of the members of this institution was likewise predetermined, Ephesians 1. All who would be members would meet this standard upon their addition by the Lord. You had to, to, to be this, for, us, for me to put you here, you have to be like I am. They were to be holy without blemish, Ephesians 1, 4. And we see how this is affected in verse 7. Notice, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to that is in keeping with and harmony with the riches of his grace. Thank God for his grace. The revealed mind of God, 1 Corinthians 2, 9-13, tells us that only blood removes the stain of sin and specifically the blood of Jesus Christ. Without the, remission, without the shedding of blood is no remission of sins. Do you suppose we need to have the blood of Christ applied to our souls? Well, if we expect to have remission of sins and be justified by the grace of the Almighty God, I would hope so. How do we wash in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Here we go with implication again. You can't get me. Now, I was raised from about 11 to about 17 years of age in the Roman Catholic Church. And, and I, mean, I don't mean to disparage anybody, but they've got some interesting beliefs. And, and I have seen, I have seen little, uh, you remember the old mustard seeds and the little, little, uh, glob of plastic that ladies would wear on. Okay, I have seen those, seen people that had a little splinter. The cross of Christ. Yeah. And I even saw, saw one that had a, had a little red splotch in it. Well, that's the blood of Jesus. Yeah. Well, I said, man, how do I get me one of those? I, mean, that's, I was a kid then. I didn't, know, I didn't know any better. Well, you know, the, the, this... How do I get hold of the blood of Jesus? Get me a handful of blood and I'll splash it all over me. It doesn't work that way. That's, again, not what he's talking about. Is it a literal washing and a literal blood? Amer Ananias came to Saul of Tarsus specifically and said, Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. Oh, you folks believe in water salvation. No, we don't. It's the rest of you all the sprinkled little babies. Acts 22 and 16, we find in Revelation 1, 5 that Jesus Christ loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. But yet in Revelation 7, 14, we see the, the angel speaking to John, talking about those folks in white robes. These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes. Wait a minute, didn't Jesus do it? Well, it said he did. But in chapter 7, 14, the same book said they implied washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So there seems to me there's a mutual give and take here. There's a mutual participation. Now this cleansing is not a literal washing away of literal filth from a, a, a literal robe or literal skin. Rather, it is a spiritual effect and application. The like figure whereunto, not the thing itself. Even baptism doth also now save us. Well, how? Not the washing away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 3 and 21. How do I contact the blood of Christ? It's, it's not literal. It's a spiritual application. Now Paul uses words that are so clear about exactly when one is cleansed from his sins that one must have an earnest desire to misunderstand how and when we obtain remission of sins through the blood of the sacrificial lamb. Read the apostles' words in Romans chapter 6, verses 15 8 through 18. We are made free from sin. Now notice this. We are made free from sin when, time element, we have obeyed from the heart, there's that spiritual application, the form of doctrine delivered you. Now this is significant. When we see those disobedient to the gospel will suffer God's vengeance in Christ's return, according to 2 Thessalonians 1 8. Those that know not God and obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ will have the wrath of God biting on them. Paul specifies what the gospel is in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. It's death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. You can't obey a fact. That's just a statement of fact. You can't obey a statement of fact. You cannot do that. Now, you can say there's a stop sign. Well, what am I supposed to do about it? Well, you better stop. How do I know? Because, well, it says stop. So you do that. You don't obey the fact of the sign. You obey what it tells you to do. 
Now, how do I obey this? He further tells us that we can obey those facts by submitting to his form as described in Romans chapter 6, 3, and 4. How should we either dead to sin, live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus' death, uh, we're, we're buried with him by, excuse me, we're buried with him by baptism and death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we shall also walk in newness of life. Well, how? When we were baptized into his death. Not literally killed, not literally put in a grave, but it's a figure of it. It's an image of it. It's not the thing itself. He likewise informs us that baptism puts us into Christ. One spirit baptized in one body, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Many of you have been, has have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ, Galatians 3, 26. Why is that important? Where all spiritual blessings in heavenly places are, exist, Ephesians 1 and verse 3. Now, would you agree with me, and I hope you would, because you'd be right if you did, not because you agree with me, because of what the Bible teaches, that salvation from sins is a spiritual blessing. Well, man, if it's not, then somebody needs to come up here and tell me exactly what it is. It's a spiritual blessing. It is from, and it is in Jesus Christ. Now, why do you suppose you need to be in Jesus Christ? That's where all spiritual blessings are. Brother Danny, that's where they all are. And if Danny wants it, he's going to be where they are. It's in Christ. How do I get there? I'm baptized into it. Now, that's when Paul says we're freed from sin. When we do today, when we do today to obtain remission of sins, Exactly that which we find obedient souls in the first century doing in order to obey apostolic preaching to obtain remission of sins, we will receive exactly today what they did back then, remission of sins and membership in the blood-bought throng known as the church Jesus promised to build. And if not, why not? Well, it doesn't apply to us today. How do you know that? Give me a book, chapter, and verse that says, but it doesn't apply to us. Well, that's all well and good for them. It doesn't apply for us, Brother Brown. Well, how do we know that? If, if I said, well, it doesn't apply to us today, I'd hope David would charge the stage and say, how do you know that? Well, I just feel it in my heart. That's all I've got is what I think, unless I've got transcendent truth to teach me what I need to know. Um. This religious institution, read about upon the page of the New Testament, is a fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, Isaiah chapter 2, going to begin in the top of the mountains. Uh, Paul told Timothy, and first uh, we go up to the mountain of the Lord's house, uh, the, the, the house of the God of Jacob, Isaiah 2, 2, and 3. On well, 1 Timothy 3, 15, Paul told T Timothy, How thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. I think that's significant. Over in I uh, Isaiah said that, we're going to go up to the house of God. Paul told Timothy how to behave in that house of God. Now, I believe that's significant. I mean, that has, that has meaning. Now, why would Paul tell Timothy how to behave in something to which he did not nor could not belong? I think that we need to think about that. Uh, the next point in the lesson was the time of inception. We're going to kind of pass over that. I want to get to some other things. This religious institution has unique terms of entrance. It's a couple of pages over in the, in the uh, book. Consider the authoritative words of the Apostle Paul in 1 uh, Corinthians 14, 37. And I was, I was thinking about this earlier. If any man think himself, to, have you ever heard of somebody say, oh, I'm a spiritual, I'm a spiritual person, I'm, I'm okay, I'm, I'm spiritual, I'm a spiritual person. Man, how do you deal with that? All right, here it is. You listen to what Spirit has to say. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things I write unto you, here it is, are the commandments of the Lord. Oh, I'm spiritual. Are you obeying from the heart the form of doctrine delivered? Well, no, I don't believe you have to do that. I don't know what you are, but you're not spiritual. If you're not willing to accept the commandments of the Spirit, how can you be spiritual? Well, I just feel it in my heart, and that's all they have. They have nothing more. And I just, I look at them and say, well, I feel you're not saved. And that really throws them for a loop. Um, but the words of Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 14, 37, as they appear in Ephesians 1, 3 through 9, he tells us in Ephesians 1, 3, that God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Now, to be certain, salvation is a spiritual blessing. We've already noticed that. We are informed that Christians are those who have met conditions established before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame. 
How do those lost in sin, according to Luke 19, 10, Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost, and separated from God, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, our sins and our iniquities have separated between you and your, your God, become holy and without blame. How do I gain redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin? I gain redemption from sin when I meet the legal requirements that God requires through submission to the law of Christ. Though he were son, let yet learn he obedience by the things which he suffered, being thereby made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to all those that obey him. How do you obey something that isn't the law? Tell me that. Explain that to me clearly enough that I can understand it. It's beyond me how they come up with this stuff. Romans 8, 1 and 2. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are Christ Jesus. In verse 2 he says, Who walk not after the flesh, but after the law, or the law of the sin, been made free from the law of sin and death, We've been saved by the law of the spirit of life. The law of spirit and life. James calls it the perfect law of liberty. Law of liberty. You cannot have freedom without guidelines in law. But this is salvation by God's grace when it is accepted by faith on man's part. Ephesians 2, verse 8 through 10. For by grace are you saved through faith. We must... Have faith in God. Hebrews 11, 1 and 6. Jesus tells us that in Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Well, why aren't you supposed to be? Well, what if I don't believe? Well, you won't be baptized. It wouldn't do you any good. You'd just be getting wet. It says, we know that faith comes by hearing God's word. Let's hear what he tells us about the terms of entrance into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus says we must hear and be taught the facts in the case relative to the gospel, John 6, they shall all be taught of God, John 6, 44 and 45. Jesus then informs us we must believe in the Messiah, John 8, 24, except you believe that I am he. We hear, in the context of John 8, we hear Jesus tell us that repentance of sin is required, Luke 13, 3 and 5. You shall die in your, you shall likewise perish if you don't repent. Confession of Jesus as Lord is required, Romans 10 and verse 10. Then we must be immersed for the remission of sin. Again, this is what Jesus said. Now, going forward, Christians must live faithfully before God and man, Revelation 2 and verse 10. There's a crucial point I want to make just right here. Lest we're charged with legalism for our salvation. Now, somebody says, oh, you're just a bunch of legalists. Mm. Faithful Bible students know that God has commanded certain works to be performed. Luke 17 and verse 10. We are unprofitable servants when we have done all that which we've been commanded to do. We have simply done the things we've been commanded to do. I can't do anything to save myself. I can't come up with any stack of good works that are sufficient to save me. Every good work anybody's ever done is commanded by the word of God by, by, direct, by direct statement or implication. So everything I do that's good in one sense is a commandment of God, but even then I'm simply doing what I've been told to do. Um, and I, there are a number of scriptures in, in the text that you need to look at, but our faithful Bible student also knows that we must act in loving faith and trust in order to receive the promised blessings. If you love me, keep my commandments. Not just keep my commandments, but if you love me, keep my commandments. It's qualified. If you love me, keep my commandments. John 5 and verse 6, the only thing that avails is faith that worketh by love, not a working faith. Not a loving faith, but a faith that worketh by love. Now, how do you read that and misunderstand it unless you just really don't like what it implies? Remember, God determined beforehand to save only those that are holy and without blame, and that souls are made holy and without blame only when they comply with the good pleasure of his will. Finally, if somebody has ever been released from their sins without being compliant, find me book, chapter, and verse that teaches that someone in the New Testament, after Acts chapter 2, obtained remission of their sins without and distinct from being submissive to the will of God. It'll be a good Bible study for you. You'll learn something that you didn't know before, that what you thought isn't there. But you'll find out that you must comply. When such is accomplished by God, we are accepted in the Beloved. When I comply with his will, he accepts me. Now this religious, religious institution likewise has a unique system of worship. 
the only, and this is and this is a lot of what this book is about well ostensibly about not really about they're just winging it as they go through it i believe the only way man is able to please god is to know what he expects of us and then to do it without fail consider the athenians acts chapter 17 and the unknown god you know when you look at acts chapter 17 i was thinking about this a while back how did they know that they were supposed to have an altar in the first place? How do they know that God wanted an altar? And if he did want an altar, how did they know? How did they know if it was supposed to be round, square, oblong, up on stilts, down on the ground, made of wood, made of war marble, just a stack of, of wood? How did they know anything? Well, they didn't. You think we got them all done? Well, I don't know. I think we better come up with a couple others. And let's put another altar out there just in case we miss somebody. Have you ever, the, what, the Hindus have over 330,000 gods? deities and none of them are good looking <laughs> I'd find I'd find me another place to worship that'd scare me to death bad enough looking at preachers I understand but some of you will call Paul at any rate talk about the unknown God Paul declared him unto them verse 22 and 23 and he told them that there is only one God and that it is possible to find him and worship him as he directs that's possible well, you think we ought to be about that business well I think we should how ought we to worship God and be able to know if our worship is acceptable to him? What do we find, brethren, in the first century doing that were under the direct instruction and oversight of the apostles when we find out what they did to be found worshiping God in a pleasing manner and replicate that process today? We can have faith and trust that we are worshiping as we ought. And I don't care what these folks have to say about the issue. They're not the apostle. They're not the ones being directed by the Holy Spirit in spite of what they, it's a spirit, but it's not the Holy One. I'll just tell you, that's, that's just my view on the thing. And I'm not trying to be mean about it. I want these fellows to repent. Wouldn't it be great? The, wouldn't the victory be great when these fellows said, you know, they're right, we're wrong, and repent and write a retraction in detail about how they're wrong? Wouldn't that be great? How could it be otherwise? Um, all right, here he comes. Well, I have a long further to go, David. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, stop sign. Huh? <laughs> in summarizing all this idea about worshiping is, as we find those folks doing in the New Testament, summarizing all of that, when we meet upon the first day of the week, partake of the Lord's Supper around his table in the kingdom, and they labor, they belabor that point quite a lot in the book. Listen to preaching. Mutually edify one another with verbal music, speaking to yourselves the psalms and spiritual songs, and contribute as we have been prospered and pray. We have successfully duplicated what faithful Christians did under the watch and care of the apostles in worship to God. It's just not any more complicated than that. I've had folks come into worship assemblies where, where we've been located. And they'll look around. Say, your stage isn't big enough to hold a choir. That's right. Why not? Well, we don't have one. I was, when we were up in Pennsylvania, uh, one of the women was working with a friend of hers and was converting her, and her husband came, and he said, y'all don't have a piano. Yes, yeah, sir, I know. We, we don't use a piano. He reached in his check, in his pocket, was getting out his checkbook. He says, I'll write you a check for that piano. Now, he's, he also said we needed it. <laughs> but that's not the point. And, and I, I was hard-pressed to refute that part of the argument. But, you know, we, and we talked about instruments of music, that, that, that we can know what it is we're supposed to do and do it acceptably. Um, how could we be anything other than that and only that? What, what sort of reasoning would cause us to conclude we would be different today than they were when we do today what they did? Why would it be any different? How could it, how could it be any different? If we do it with the same understanding, we practice the same details, with the same attitude, how could we be anything different than what they were? I, so, I, I need help with that one. Somebody needs to explain that to me. Now let me answer this last question. The question being what sort of reasoning would cause us to conclude we would be different than what 
than they were when we do what they did. I want to ask that lest you go away unfulfilled. It is reasoning from a mind that is hardened. Luke 8, verses 5 and 12. A mind that is after the flesh bereft of the spirit of God. Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 9. A mind that is carnal, unable to grasp fundamentals of the word. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the first three verses. A heart that is dull of hearing, needing milk. Unable to digest meat, being unskillful in the world, word, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11 through 14. The book's authors have a skewed view of that religious institution you read about upon the page of the New Testament. This is the case because of this quote, and I'm quoting. It has been said that churches, uppercase churches, of Christ have three sacraments. Baptism the Lord's Supper, and the Lord's Day or Assembly. This, continuing now, this is a significant aspect of the Stone-Campbell movement, quote-unquote. In this quote, we see the author's view of the church. The capitalization of church indicates that this view, that it is a, uh, indicates his view that it is a proper noun, and a proper noun is the name of a particular person, place, or thing. The church has not been given a formal name in the scripture, it is men that construct denominations and give them names to indicate their distinctiveness from all others. Furthermore, the authors claim that this church, uppercase, of which they write, had its origin in something they denominate the Stone Campbell Movement, quote unquote, in the above quote. Regarding this church, uppercase, the timing is wrong. The place is wrong, the founders are wrong, therefore the organization is wrong. Whatever they are writing about cannot be that religious institution described on the page of the New Testament. These men, along with all those preceding them, including those that to follow, have no authority to revision, much less transform anything regard, in regards to that blood bought, per, uh, body purchased by God's own blood. Having said all of this, Proceeding, we must point out that men are able to slice, dice, puree, poach, dilute, or simmer any organization created by man to their heart's content. They would have as much authority to do that as did those found in these organizations possessed in the first place. But when it comes to the body of Jesus, uh, the body Jesus claimed as his, Matthew 16, 18, then we are set for the defense of the gospel. We're in your debt for that great lesson. When you put both of the lessons together, they, I think, do a great job in setting out the totality of what we didn't know on that. Marvelous, marvelous lesson. I, I couldn't help but think about, it goes back to some of what Terry said yesterday, and several of you, no doubt will happen throughout the rest of the week, of how jokes, the right kind of jokes, actually set out some very profound principles on a very simple level, but they're very important to writing the Bible word truth or understanding anything. <laughs> I thought of one. Uh, it, I think it came out over the internet somewhere a year or two ago, but it had to do with a fellow in Texas who comes up to a stop sign. And he just slows down and then goes on, and there's the traffic policeman there. So he pulls him over. And he said, didn't you see the stop sign back there? He said, well, yes, I did. He said, well, why didn't you stop? He said, well, I, I, I slowed down. And uh, he said, but stop. He said, well, it's all in the interpretation of stop. He said, and started a big rippet and uh, had a fit over it. And the policeman stood back, and he's a pretty big fellow. And he let him rant and rave and engage in uh, modern hermeneutics on the meaning of the word <laughs> stop. And... Uh, Finally, he just snatched him up and threw him down and put his knee on the back of his head and started beating him with a baton. The guy was screaming and yelling and all that. And finally, the fellow said, would you rather for me to stop or slow down? <laughs> now, you can read all sorts of commentaries on that. It won't get any clearer than that as to the meaning of words. Words have meanings. And uh, we might mess up a few times in various things in this world. But when it comes to the word of God, it's here for a reason. Amen. It's to communicate God's will to us, and God's made us 
to be able to understand it and understand that it's God's will for our lives. And we can know what the Bible says about the assembly of the saints convened for religious purposes, and we can understand the regulations of God concerning those particular matters as well as everything else that pertains to life and godliness. I think Peter had something to say about that in his life and godliness relative to the importance of the word of God. But we thank you again so very much, Brother Gene, for that lesson. We'll stand dismissed for about nine minutes. And remember, the ladies are finishing up over here. Also, remember, we have some paper here and on the, the, uh, uh, in the back for you to write your questions on this afternoon for the open forum. And please keep that in mind. We're dismissed. <laughs>